Our time with Justinian is nearly at an end. His conquest of Rome lost, his people decimated by plague. The last man to dream of a reunited Rome has seen that dream slip through his fingers. But Justinian was never idle, even as he crossed his 65th year, and he was never one to give up on that dream. And though it would never seem as natural or as inevitable as it must have in the 530s, to the mind of Justinian, the thing that had once seemed his glorious destiny was still in the 550s his responsibility. And so, where luck, brilliance, and splendor once served, labor, persistence, and time would now be his tools. With monumental effort, an empire near ruin was brought back to a functioning and even somewhat prosperous state. With renewed national fortunes came that lifeblood of armies, money. With the cash in hand to once again pay soldiers and equip troops, Justinian prepared to deal with the threats that had assailed the empire from all sides. And so we come to one of the most inscrutable parts of the reign of Justinian, the Last Company, the final group of men that he would choose to execute his will and restore the empire. For he chose a group of men who seemed like impossible candidates. They were ancient men, the last of a generation. He picked the Septarian Basis to retake Lazica, though he had largely been at fault for re-losing Rome. He chose Scholasticus, a court eunuch without any experience in the field, to command forays against the Slavs to the north and to retake Italy. He picked the aging eunuch Narses, the same Narses who had bribed the deems for Justinian during Nica, and yes, the very same guy who may have doomed the first Italian campaign by disputing Belisarius' commands. It was a strange bunch to put in charge of an army, and yet in Lazica they won. They took Petra and at last made a peace with Persia that recognized Lazica as part of the Roman sphere. And in the Balkans they won. It may have taken some diplomatic wizardry from Justinian, but they won. And in Italy? In Italy, Narses did what Belisarius could never do. He finally kicked the Ostrogoths out of Italy entirely. Sure, he had 20,000 men at his disposal and a full purse to work with, but with these resources, he was at last able to pin the Ostrogoths down in open battle and truly, conclusively beat them in the field. In Italy, they finally won. Heck, while Narses was out in Italy, Justinian even received a letter from Hispania requesting his help, and sent 2,000 men under the command of the octogenarian bureaucrat Liberius, who promptly took over half the country and set up the province of Spania. If nothing else, Justinian's one great talent was somehow, even when all odds seemed against it, knowing exactly the right person to pick for a job. And that talent hadn't failed him, even when so much else had. But nothing is ever quite done. A wave of natural disasters hit the empire, and then the plague returned. While it didn't quite bring the empire to its knees the way the first wave did, it did create an opening for the Bulgars to sweep out of the north and raid the empire again. A contingent of them even came within a hundred kilometers of Constantinople. With no other armies nearby, Justinian called on Belisarius one last time. The general who had long since put down his arms gathered together a force of retired soldiers, guardsmen, and volunteers from the deems for one last service to the empire. And here he did what Belisarius does. He set far more campfires than he had men, and as the battle began, he had his main force make as much noise as possible while he secreted away a part of his army for an ambush. And when the Bulgar forces attacked, they thought themselves outnumbered and surrounded as the ambush force poured fire from one side, and they heard the great din from the other. And so they fled. But that would be the last service for Belisarius. And one by one, the chapter closed on all of our players. Trebonian had died in 542, Theodora in 548, John the Cappadocian fades out of the historical records sometime in the 550s. In 554, mortality makes even our historian Procopius put down his pen. And Belisarius? He himself passed in 565. Almost all of the minor players, those who have just had a bit part on Justinian's stage, they too are dead. Justinian is alone. The only one to outlive them all would be Narses, who would make it to the grand old age of 95. But he was out there in Italy, reorganizing the province. A generation of greatness had passed. Justinian would spend his last years trying to consolidate what he'd achieved, and continuing his ill-fated attempts to reconcile the Christian church. But the days of glory and of boundless empire were at an end. In 565, after one of the longest reigns of any emperor in Roman history, and just a few months after Belisarius, he too died. It's almost impossible not to wonder what his last thoughts were. Did he see the success of his conquests, or their cost? Did he die a man disappointed at failure to achieve his dream, to see a reunited Rome and a reunited church? Or did he look out at the Hagia Sophia one last time and think about how much he'd grown the empire? how he'd rationalized the laws, brought Rome back into the fold, and seen the empire through the plague without being torn apart by civil war. 
We'll never know. To this day, Justinian remains one of the great what-ifs of history. What if the plague hadn't struck? What if the Ostrogoths had capitulated one of those dozen times they were just about to? What if the Persians had been led by somebody less competent, or just been a little slower to attack? What if Justinian's successors were as energetic and as capable as he had been? If any one of those things had turned out differently, perhaps we would consider him the greatest Roman emperor of all time. Perhaps the West would speak Greek and Latin and still see Constantinople as its capital. But none of those what-ifs took place, and within a hundred years almost everything he had gained would be lost. Only the Hagia Sophia and his law code would truly endure. And for his conquests, for his vision of a Western Empire, what did he sacrifice? Perhaps everything. He emptied the Byzantine treasury, taxed heavily, created thousands of miles of new borders to guard for an empire reduced by plague and a soldiery reduced by his own wars. Italy would turn out to cost the empire more than it ever brought in, and North Africa would suffer a series of rebellions and convulsions due to his inability to pay the troops there. Would the Byzantines be so unprepared for the Muslim conquest 70 years later if Justinian hadn't squandered the empire's resources on the ephemeral west? Would the empire have been bled dry by continuous Persian wars and further conflicts with barbarian tribes to the north if Justinian had just instead focused all that energy on settling these problems rather than his romantic dream of restoring Rome? But for all this, one can't help but respect the dream and the monumental efforts of the men of his age to make it come true. And in hearing about his work, one can't help but get a little lost in that dream and imagine what the empire would have been if he'd achieved the success he came so close to. And so we leave Justinian and all those who stood by his side as a question and a cautionary tale, an enigma and a promise, a parable to inspire us to dream, and a warning against being blinded by our own vision. And though the reign of Justinian is at an end, we continue to feel the echoes of these men and women centuries later, their triumphs and their failures. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.